hold him as either a libertarian or a left Occupy kind of guy because he had elements of both and this is Tom Paine Tom Paine so a little bit a couple of minutes on Tom Paine if you don't know anything about him He was a, somebody who's very different from the other American founding fathers very different because he was not part of the elite I mean most of these famous founding fathers that all these books are published about now today They're part of the American League George Washington was the richest man in America mostly through land owners. A lot of the other folks, wealthy plantation owners with lots of slaves, people like Thomas Jefferson. In the north, up here, you have people like John Adams, part of the elite, the financial, legal elite, political elite. Tom Paine is really different. Tom Paine, as late as 1774, he's still in England, he's floundering, he's an artisan, um, he's having a hard way to go, and he decides, well, he's gonna go to America in 1774, so just a couple of years before the revolution. He goes. He gets a letter of introduction from Ben Franklin, lands in Philadelphia, and he becomes intoxicated by American anti-authoritarianism. And just intoxicated by it. And being more, more connected to the regular folks, he realizes that the American anti-authoritarianism is much, much closer to, to what, you know, to, to much closer to, to, um, to where it's much further along than the lot of the elite. Okay? So, for him, he realizes, you know, here's George Washington, who's still toasting King George as late as 1775. And most of, these, most of these folks are just railing against Parliament's taxation without representation. But Payne goes, to heck with the whole of British authority, not just Parliament, to heck with King George, to heck with the British East India Corporation, to heck with all. And he utters the taboo word at the time of independence. It was taboo, even among these founding fathers. And he's a secessionist, really. Tom Paine is one of the most, he's one of the great revolutionaries in American and world history, but he's also a secessionist. And so he puts out this thing called Common Sense in 7, January 1776. And by the end of the revolution, a half a million people read it, and which would be the equivalent of over 50 million people today, and he sparks a revolution, all right? Now, Tom Paine, if you understand who he is, he was, he's definitely, you know, you, you would have a hard time labeling him as either a libertarian or a left-occupied person. He certainly believed in private property. He certainly was an entrepreneur. He was always tinkering with these bridge ideas, iron bridge ideas, smokeless candles, okay? He really wasn't crazy about government. Libertarians always invoke his famous statement about government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil. But, but what libertarians sometimes forget was he also wrote a pamphlet called Agrarian Justice in the 1790s. And in that pamphlet, he, he goes beyond Social Security in some ways. He decides that, like, look, people have lost their natural inheritance because of the system of landed property, and it's up to the wealthy elite to kick in some money, not only for people who are disabled, but also for folks when they turn 21, okay? Because he believed that if you're going to have any kind of real democracy, which he was passionate, anti-authoritarian, passionately believed in democracy, you had, you couldn't have a, a, a lot of people, you know, a certain amount of people with a lot of money and, and nobody else with any. So he had elements of both. All right, and I think this is real important for folks to remember here that this, a lot of what the divides to nowadays into separate camps have been created by by the media, by mainstream corporate media to kind of divide and conquer people, all right? There's a lot of connections throughout um, American history between, you know, of anti-authoritarians and populists. All right, so some of the ways I think that we can really advance uh, these coalitions, these alliances, is just a little bit about how we talk about the ruling elite, what they're really all about, what names we use for them, all right? And so one of the things that i found that just for the mainstream corporate media, just the idea to talk about that, that we don't have a democracy here, we just do have a kind of tyranny in America, that seems for them crazy. That, that, that seems nuts, okay? But, you know, the reality is, you know, for, I mean, for them, the only kind of tyrannies exist in places like the Middle East or in Africa where you have some sort of a dictator, you know, somebody in a military uniform, you know, shooting a, a rifle in the sky, not caring where the bullets come down, that kind of thing, you know? But the reality is, most American people believe that we don't really live in a democracy. They, they know, uh, I talk about it, get up, stand up, they go through the polls, most Americans have been opposed to these endless, senseless wars. Most Americans were opposed to these insurance company big bank bailouts. Most Americans are opposed to a lot of these issues that still happen, but they realize that they feel like they have no power, which means they, they're saying they don't live in a democracy. They're living in some sort of tyranny. So, so what do we call this tyranny that would help unify 
anti-authoritarians. Well, the term that I use is corporatocracy, which a corporatocracy means that it's a combination of these giant too big to fail corporations, these large banks, large insurance companies, now we know too big to jail CEOs, along with these, you know, some of these mega billionaires who made their money through corporate welfare, corporate cronyism, who hand out their money, hand out a few million here and there to these politicians, Democrats and Republicans, okay, in government, in federal government, in state government. So it's a combination of those things. And I noticed in 2011, again, the mainstream media, uh, corporate media did not report this, but actually there was dialogue, a lot of dialogue, in-person dialogue, between uh, Ralph Nader and Ron Paul talking about this issue, using words like corporatist. I mean, they used words like corporatist sim sim similarly to the way people during the American Revolution talked about the Tories. And they viewed them both of themselves as as anti-corporatists, both Ron Paul and Ralph Nader, on those issues that I already talked about, anti-war, anti-corporate welfare. Um, they also were talked about uh, the uh, talked about NAFTA, the Patriot Act, lots of issues they went through. They, they also made it clear that they didn't agree on everything. And they weren't talking about forming any kind of political party, but they believed that there was lots of things that they agreed on. So my personal experience using this word corporatocracy and corporatism is that it really unifies folks. I'll tell you a story. I did this uh, libertarian radio show a few years back. It was out in New Orleans with a guy. Um, the show was called Baldy and the Blonde. Baldy and the Blonde. And I talked to, uh, I talked to Baldy, Tom. And we were going through this whole idea of corporatocracy. And he was real interested in it. He said, you know, that makes perfect sense to me. What's the difference between the kind of left view and the kind of libertarian view of corporatocracy. And I said, well, you hear a lot of libertarians rail against big government, big government. And a lot of folks on the left talk about these giant corporations with the idea that like, you know, those who have the most money, you know, the giant corporations, people with the most money are really the senior partners in this, in this corporatocracy and the politicians are really the lackeys, more like what George Collins said. Um, and this guy, Tom, who was a self-identified libertarian, he said, he started to laugh. He says, well, Bruce, you know, you might have convinced me just on this issue not to be a libertarian anymore, to be a, to be a left occupy person, because this seemed to make sense to him. And he started to laugh. And I, and I thought that's also an important thing. The reason why I liked Tom that was because he moved, I convinced him to be something different, but because he was willing to not be afraid of what his audience thought was politically correct or not politically correct, willing to care more about the issues, willing to care more about a dialogue than what was, you know, what was pleasing to his particular camp and his audience. And that's really important if you want, we really want to form alliances among anti-authoritarians. Another real important area I think that will really help folks is to move these kinds of alliances, coalitions, and uh, convergences along is to, is to really have more confidence, a lot more confidence that Although, like, people here are more active than the rest of the American people who have been lots of ways pacified, that really, they represent what, what I'm talking about, what we're talking about here at this festival, really represents what the majority of American people feel. So, for, I'll give you an example of this that I talk about in Get Up Stanley, but I updated a poll, I updated a, an article more recently, if there was a Rasmussen's Report poll a few years ago on populism. And they discovered that 65% of Americans were populous, 80% if you include leaners. Well, how'd they do that? Well, there's a couple, let me give you a couple of questions and give you the percentage breakdown. On one question, they asked, you know, do you believe, do you trust the judgment of the American people on important issues that face our society, or do you trust the judgment of the American political leaders? And 76% trusted the American people, did not trust the political leaders. That's populism. They also ask people and don't like the government telling them what to do, and libertarians who may or may not like to smoke their weed, but certainly don't like the government telling them what to do. Pot for recreational use is now legal, as everybody knows, in a couple of states, Colorado and Washington. Legal mar medical marijuana is legal in many other states, right? So. This thing is working, and it's working in a lot of other areas that most Americans don't know, too. Historically, uh, there's another area um, in, in our history together, both le left anti-authoritarians and libertarian anti-authoritarians have, have won major victories working together. One 
Um, Ralph Nader talked about in his recent book where he's talking about this convergence himself. And he talked about uh, a, a, a recent, in, in the, well not recently, a couple, of, a couple of decades ago, was a battle against the nuclear power plant, which was at first just opposed by sort of left environmental folks at Clinch River, Tennessee. But then a lot of folks who cared about fiscal responsibility, okay, didn't like the idea that something which we've been told, American people have been told cost 400 million, was gonna cost almost 9 billion, and they joined together, there was an alliance, there was a taxpayers against Clinch River that was victorious. Okay, in my own world, my own activism against one aspect of the corporatocracy, the psychiatric pharmaceutical industrial complex, that's my major areas of activism, there's been a coalition for many years of people who are libertarian, anti-authoritarians, most famously psychiatrists named Thomas Saas, along with left anti-authoritarians, like psych psychoanalyst Eric Fromm, lots of other folks battling the kind of pathologizing of normal human behaviors. And I've written a lot about the pathologizing of anti-authoritarianism, the pathologizing of non-compliance, stubbornness, especially in young people. And I've gotten a lot of media attention from the libertarian world, who's very much interested in that, and the left anti-authoritarian world, very much interested in this stuff. So this stuff, I think it's just real important for folks to realize that these coalitions have been successful, they have worked already, right? So I think those are real important things to keep in mind. I think the areas that we can get better at, I think there's, what I want to finish up with some things that we can really get better at in moving these anti-authoritarian coalitions and alliances Long, is to recognize that some, while all anti-authoritarians passionately oppose illegitimate authority, they passionately challenge and resist illegitimate authority, that some of them by nature of their personality, their, their character, all kind, their history, they're going to be much more con con focused on um, the uh, tyranny towards itself, okay, towards the individual, all right? And some are, some are going to be caring more about the tyranny towards community, sort of communitarian anti-authoritarians, they're commonly called. And the reality is, anti-authoritarians need to get better at being more whole. They need to be more whole for themselves, but also to form these alliances. And, and nobody said this really better than somebody 2,000 years ago, who was in a battle against the tyranny of that era, which was the Roman Empire, and this is the person I'm talking about is Hillel, okay, the great Jewish scholar, who said a couple of thousand years ago, he, this famous saying that he said, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am for myself only, what am I? If not now, when? And again, if you listen to those words, you can see who he's talking to there. This, this hasn't changed. There are some people who are still focused on you know, the dictatorship's control of self and individual versus the, the tyranny's control of the community. Right? And we have to care about both. Okay? And that, to the extent that we care about both, we're going to have better dialogues between anti-authoritarians, so-called on the left Occupy folks, and, we're gonna have, and folks who are libertarian anti-authoritarians. And the last area that, I, just to kind of, just the last thing I want to touch on, keeping my sort of psychologist hat on, is that we have to kind of be blunt and candid about how sometimes anti-authoritarians who are insecure, who are on the defensive, who are in, filled with too much rage, can move into self-destructive behavior. Instead of just challenging illegitimate authority, okay, and resisting that, they can become compulsively contrary. I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you're with somebody and you're agreeing on like 99 things in a row and then they get to one thing that you disagree on and that's what you focus in on to the point where it can get acrimonious to the point that it destroys a whole relationship. I see a lot of head shakes like this has not just happened to me, it's happened to a lot of you too out there. And I think that's something that we, the, the great antidote to that, the great antidote to that is for folks to continue to take these issues very seriously, but to learn the difference between taking these issues so serious, seriously and taking themselves too seriously. And to the extent that they can do that, they can be, if they feel more secure in who they are, they can engage in dialogue. And dialogue is crucial because, see, you know, the history of tyranny throughout not just American, American history, but in world history, is always that tyrants got one major play in their playbook, which is divide and conquer. They're going to always use that over and over again. And we've got to counter that, and the major way that we can counter that is to not divide ourselves. Okay? And to the extent that we cannot, we don't divide ourselves, 
what's going to happen is, is that we're going to get something a lot closer to liberty, to freedom, and to justice. Okay, thank Hello, you. Thanks for your time. It. The Porcupine Outdoor Club Recreation Morning Hangover Hike. <laughs> so how's that? Is that good? Where are we today? Oh, uh, Magic Mountain. Uh, something Vermont. Londonderry. Londonderry for uh, something. Liberty. Free Peaceful Unity <laughs> Festival. There we go. <laughs> good. Could, could you say the full name of it? What is it again? Free Peaceful Unity Festival. Free Peaceful Unity Festival. <laughs> You're torturing me. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I gotta get rid of this. <laughs> and I know it's, it's leaving me before I'm t before we turn around. What are we seeing over here, Amish? Looks like zip lining, two of them anyway. Is that an activity you've partaken in? 40 bucks, man. <laughs> I would do it for free. Nothing's free. How much did climbing this mountain cost? <laughs> I'll let you know when we start. We didn't even start yet. <laughs> you know, we may get charged at the top. going on the cloud. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's an anarchist thing, all those no no things. Elaborate. A lot of stuff going on over there. I don't think it's just zip one. It's like an obstacle course. Is that one of Outdoor adventures. Yeah, so people pay what you get to do for free in the army, right? You get paid to. <laughs> oh, that looks like crap. Maybe get sneak through the woods. Over here. Still not breathing heavy. I'm old. I said that before. You know, it looks all flat, right?
Yeah, I'm not the fall down and can't get up type yet. <laughs> Can you explain the interaction we just had with, to our audience? I was a, per, a Liberty Park participant. I see him the whole time. What was his experience? <laughs> oh, falling down twice. Did he do this Fall trail or another? Oh, he was saying he was over there. But that didn't sound much different than what we're doing. You know, I think you're going to make the cloud rain. Well, these are deep crevices. We should make a video of you jumping it. Oh, we yeah, show you know. here and then we CGI you in the air. There we go. Land over here like, ooh. Be a good show. Million dollar old man. So you're not breathing heavy. You're what? You're what? What are you doing? <laughs> Should be illegal. It's not right. We're allowed to go up this. I suppose. Oh. Yeah, next year we could do it in the night. Moon. Anybody want to camp up there? Yeah, they're gonna carry their bit that monster tent. <laughs> Gotta get a helicopter to drop off the supplies. Well, actually, it's a ski. They have ski left, so just get them to run it. Oh yeah, that's true. Oh, we're in the green, that's the green mountain. One of them uh, is Stratton. One of them's now snow. Been up most of them. But in Vermont, or the greens, there's most of the major mountains you can either drive up or chair left up. Because they're soft mountains, they don't have deep hard surfaces. Yeah, no they do. That's a long trail. That's a long, uh, AT and long trail goes right through there. No, there's, there's fun spots. Hand over hand some places. This ain't hand over yet. <laughs> well, we haven't gone over yet. Oh look, there's another pool. <laughs> yeah, no, she looks like she does this every day. Come on, buddy. It's gonna get cold. I'm a Terminator, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's relentless. Up, up and away. Super hikers.
you take him out. Just came up there. <laughs> Oh, that, no, that's too big of a pond. That's not the one we drove by. With the fake uh, geese. Oh, dude. Yeah, this is it. Officially, that is. Now I can see them out. You are here. How'd they know that? Twilight zone. Yeah, let's give it the shot. We can always road get the road again. Let's take the red line or I'm the Terminator, like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Lots of strawberry plants. Oh my god, oh my god, I'm falling! I'm falling down the mountain! Oh my god, I'm falling down the mountain! <laughs> 